Good morning, all, and uh, welcome to today's uh, current affairs class. And today, as as well, we'll be doing a little different again. And uh, here we start. Let us start our class. The very first news I want to come across is World Biofuel Day 2018, which was celebrated on was celebrated on 10th of 10th August right that was yesterday so on 10th August 2018 World Biofuel Dry Day 2018 was celebrated so let us understand what are the important things over here in this uh, first we need to understand what it is every year on 10th of August Right, as I have already told that on 10th August is celebrated. So every year on 10th of August, it is observed as World Biofuel Day in a bid to create awareness about, it is basically to create awareness about non-fossil fuels. So question may come that what is the use of what is the purpose or what is the objective of World Biofuel Day. So it is basically for the awareness. Okay, it is not implementation, it is awareness. There is a difference, right? So on this day, that is in 1893, on this day, that is in 1893, Sir Rudolf Diesel, okay, the inventor of diesel engine for the first time successfully ran mechanical engine with peanut oil in 1893 his research experiment has predicted here again the important term is peanut oil i'm rounding off the one which is important so awareness of non-fossil fuels then peanut oil his year was 1893 he was sir rudolph diesel right inventor of diesel engine his research experiment has predicted that vegetable oil is going to replace the fossil fuels is going to replace the fossil fuels in the next century to fuel different mechanical engines thus to mark this extraordinary achievement since world biofuel day is observed every year on 10th of August okay so question may come that when biofuel day is celebrated so what that the answer will be 10th of August in every year. Now, what are the government initiative to promote the use of biofuels? Let us understand one by one with the hierarchy. The very first that was in 2014. The government of India has undertaken a number of initiatives to increase blending of biofuels. Hence, as of now, we are not we haven't come across with 100% biofuels, but what we have come across is blending of biofuels. The very first step, the government have taken the major interventions include administrative price mechanism for ethanol, simplifying the procurement procedures of OMCs, right? Amending the provisions of industries, Development and Regulation Acts, Development and Regulation Act 1951, and enabling lignocellulose route for ethanol procurement. Right? That was the very first point, the initiative taken by government. Second is the government approved the national policy on biofuels. So again, the national policy on biofuels 2018 itself in June 2018. The policy have the objective of reaching 20% ethanol blending and 5% biodiesel blending by the year 2030. So among other things, the policy expands the scope of feedstock for ethanol production and has provided for incentives for production of advanced biofuels. Moreover, recently the government has increased the price of C heavy molasses okay, based ethanol 
to rupees 43.70 from rupees 40.80 to give a boost to EBP program that is ethanol right ethanol based petroleum program price of B heavy molasses based ethanol and sugarcane juice based ethanol has been fixed for the first time at 47 so this 47.40 is first time fixed for sugarcane juice the ethanol which is coming from sugarcane okay fixed for 47.40 the government has reduced GST as well reduced GST on ethanol for blending in fuel from 18 percent to five percent since this is a biofuel the ministry of petroleum and natural gas is making all efforts to increase ethanol supply for petrol and has taken several steps in direction so these were few initiatives that were taken by the comments now what outcome we are going to come from this the outcome that we are going to this is this interventions of the government of India have shown positive results obviously ethanol blending in petrol has increased ethanol blending has increased from 38 crore liters to estimated 141 crore liters right in 2017 in 18 biodiesel blending in the country started in 2015 and have gone to oil marketing companies have allocated nearly 7.6 liters of biodiesel oil POCs are also planning to set up 12 second generation so here again a point Twelve second generation that is 2G biorefineries to augment ethanol supply and address environmental issues uh, basically which arises out of burning of agriculture by biomass like recently if you uh, remember like uh, last year last this summer itself not last year this summer itself uh, there was a tussle between Punjab Haryana and Delhi the reason was Delhi's pollution whereas the uh, Delhi government uh, uh, in the Green Tribunal National Green Tribunal he was or the meteorological department was telling that the pollution is because of overcrowded number of uh, vehicles in the city whereas uh, the chief minister uh, Arvind Kejriwal was claiming that the crop residuals which were burnt and this residual burning because of that residual burning that particular pollutions is traveling to Delhi by air and that is polluting the air of Delhi so what happened is such mechanism so if we take those residuals as a biomass and if the government start procuring the first thing is that the environmental issue there will be if that is the case because of which Delhi is getting polluted so that will be obviously come into a still that right that is the first and the second thing is that the residuals which were lying idle and were burned of no use even those will come in use as well right so those are the few things which have to be linked when it comes to this particular topic as I was already uh, I have already told that you know such policies have been come and, and India have the government have taken certain initiative so apart from this the Ministry of uh, new and renewable energy under this ministry of new and renewable energy the poly policy which have been categorized as basic biofuels basic biofuels with first generation bioethanol and biodiesel second generation that is advanced biofuel then municipal solid waste to drop in fuels that is third generation 
first was basic biofuel second was advanced biofuels from bioethanol and the third one is from bio municipal solid waste like uh, you see the municipality collect uh, this uh, residual food residuals or the uh, wet wet pollutions basically the food pollutions which you are making by throwing out if the same is collected and uh, uh, will be handed to municipal solid waste so from there also we can get a biofuel and that particular biofuel is called as third generation biofuel okay that is also called bio cng right and uh, the policy has the objective to reach 20 percent as i already have discussed this in the previous slide so those are the few things by the year 2030 okay so what wherever i'm underlying so those parts are very important this may not the question may come may not come directly but indirectly there are many such questions which are hidden in this particular topic so i have elaborated with all uh, possible questions okay so now in the similar fashion international day of world in indigenous people 2018 which was celebrated on 9th like biofuel was celebrated on 10th this international day of world indigenous people was celebrated on 9th okay so here basically the purpose is to strengthen international cooperation for solving problems faced by indigenous people in areas such as human rights environment education health and social development okay in the human right yes of course because uh, they have been asked to uh, somewhere keep their cultures apart not directly but indirectly because like by bringing western and other culture and blending other cultures into their own then environment is because they protect they believe that hills rivers are the gods and they should not be disturbed and human have particularly in recent few years in, uh, in recent decade uh, humans for their own purpose have destroyed the natural beauty those the hills forest and rivers they have changed the course of river so these are the quiet things which are opposed by the indigenous people and indigenous people uh, feel that there is a threat to their human life there is a threat to their life right so that is one of the purpose apart even they are not provide education proper education because they are located in the far integral places and government uh, is yet to reach to a quality education uh, that have to be provided to them then the health and social risk development right apart from this this united nations general assembly unga apart from this this unga on December 23rd, United Nations Journal, in short, it is called UNGA, on December 23rd, 1994, proclaimed 9th August as the International Day of World Indigenous People, and the day marks the day on the first meeting of the UN Working Group on indigenous population of the sub-commission on the promotion and protection of human rights promotion and protection of human rights in 1882 okay so those are the few things one need to remember one need to understand in this particular topic now let us go to the next topic the next topic is study waves of active learning form for young aspiring minds in short swayam what is swayam basically the ministry of hrd has embarked on a major and new initiative project called swayam that is study waves of active learning for young aspiring minds which will provide one integrated platform and portal for online courses and you know this covers 
all higher education subjects and skill sector courses. Basically, this will cover this will cover all higher education subjects and skill sector courses. In the second line, you can see here. Apart from this, the objective is to ensure that every student in the country has access to the best quality higher education at the affordable cost. The program Swayam and Swayam Prabha, okay, the program Swayam and Swayam Prabha for making education more accessible and depository were convinced and executed by the Ministry of HRD. Swayam Prabha would be tapping into potential of direct to home service. Swayam Prabha will be DTH, direct to home service, wherein a person can install a disc antenna for about rupees 1500 and have access to 32 digital education channels run by HRD ministry. Okay. Next news is the government has recently launched the phase of two of Unnat Bharat Abhyan. I'll be making you understand further. It is basically the flagship program. Now, what is this Unnat Bharat program? It is basically the program of Ministry of HRD and it aims to link higher education institutions. It aims to link higher education institutions with at least at least five villages to enable the institutions contribute to the economy and social betterment of these villages using their knowledge base. The institutions will provide the knowledge and technology. They will basically provide the knowledge and technology support to improve the livelihoods in rural areas. It will also help, okay, it will also help in upgrading the capabilities of both the public and private sectors, both technical and non-technical institutions that have been invited to build systems in villages as per their strengths. Each selected institute, each selected institute would adopt a cluster of villages or panchayats and gradually expand the outreach over a period of time. And IIT Delhi for that has been designated to function as the National Coordinating Institute, IIT Delhi will be, has been designated to function as a National Coordinating Institutions for this particular program. So this is basically a program, Udhan Bharat program is basically a program where colleges have been asked to tie up with at least five villages for the improvement of knowledge and technology for a better livelihood in rural areas. Fourth, as you can see in the picture, this is the world's largest bird sculpture, okay, which have been inaugurated in Kolab. So this have been recently inaugurated in Kolab, which is in Kerala, right? And what is the capital of Kerala? Tiru And And who is the chief minister? Vijayan is the chief minister, right? So here, question may come that where is the world's largest bird sculpture? So in that answer would be Kulam, Kerala. Next, this is regarding GII, Global Innovation Index, that is 2018, launched in India. India's rank on Global Innovation Index, GII, improved from 60 last year to 57 this year it has improved from sixty last year to 57 this year so this year we are 57th out of 192 member countries where switzerland 
नीदरलैंड स्वीडन यूके सिंगापुर द यूएस फिनलैंड डेनमार्क लीड द 2018 रैंकिंग सो बेसिकली दिस दिस 2018 रैंकिंग इज लेड बाय दिस स्टेटेड कंट्रीज दैट आर स्विट्जरलैंड नीदरलैंड स्वीडन यूके सिंगापुर यूएसए फिनलैंड एंड डेनमार्क GII is basically an annual ranking. So first of all, let us understand what is GII. So GII is an annual ranking of countries by their capacity for and success in innovation. It is published by Cornell University in SID and the World Intellectual Property Organization in partnership with other organization. Okay. So here the uh, you know, uh, the organization. Which is involved is Cornell University, right? So the university is Cornell University in Sid and the World Intellectual Property Organization in partnership with other organization and institution. Index was started basically in 2017 by In Sid. and world business a british magazine basically the gii is computed by taking a simple average by how by taking a simple average of scores in two sub indices the innovation iii and ioi basically iii this is iii innovation input index and innovation output index so what this do is done is this is taken the average of this two is taken and this becomes gii okay so this is triple i innovation input index and innovation output index and average of this two are taken to calculate the gii index okay let us understand uh, let us know further uh, let uh, let us go for further details in this what's needed basically is transform india's innovation ecosystem basically the agenda is to transform innovation ecosystem so that uh, further more companies should be entering to the country and more innovations and r&d should happen in the country so uh, innovation economy by formulating a new innovation policy to attract r&d investment into cutting edge technologies and build appropriate infrastructure and institutions at the same time to tap global hotspots in innovation in latest technologies like artificial intelligence ai blockchain and robotics etc connect tinkering labs in the schools with startup business and high end educational institutions target efficient productive and outcome driven r&d in the government sector okay so the next news is ministry of new and renewable energy to propose draft for setting up national energy storage mission that is nesm for india basically the proposal is given by the expert committee which have referred has which a uh, referred has proposed a draft nesm that is national energy storage mission which with objective to strive for leadership in energy storage sector by creating an enabling policy and regulatory framework that encourages manufacturing deployment innovation and further cost reduction key areas for energy storage applications include integrating renewable energy with distribution and transmission grids setting uh, rural micro micro grids with diversified loads or stand alone system developing storage component of electric mobility plants highlight uh, of this uh, draft national energy storage missions let us understand the draft expects to kick start grid connected energy storage in india set up in regulatory framework and encourage and encourage indigenous manufacturing of batteries so basically somewhere we are looking for indigenous manufacture manufacturing of batteries 
the draft also sets a realistic target it also sets a realistic target of 15 to 20 gigawatt hours of grid connected storage within next five years power grids do not currently use storage options so power grids are not using any storage options as of now that would help in the smoothly integrating renewable energy sources the mission will also focus on seven verticals first is indigenous manufacturing okay so the very first one is indigenous manufacturing and an assessment of technology and cost trends a policy and regulatory framework financing business models and market creation research and development and last but not the least standards and testing before planning for any energy storage right so the energy which is getting uh, wasted now can be stored coming to the significance of this energy storage is one of the most crucial and critical components of India's energy infrastructure strategy and also for supporting India's sustained trust to renewables renewable energy sources now make up almost one-fifth of India's total installed power capacity however as power grids increase their share of solar and wind energy the problem remains that the peak supply of renewable sources does not always meet peak demand for instance solar energy generation may be at its peak at noon but unless stored it will not be available when needed to light up homes at night so moreover renewable sources are inherently intermittent there are days when the wind does not blow or the sky is cloudy so even we have to uh, look after the periods where there will be no, where the day will be without a sun i mean without sun rays so it will quite impossible to tap solar's energy there may be a time without winds i mean very less wind that is required for running the wind power so those are also a few constant areas where research and development have to be done that even the things should be running when even there is not sun rays no sun rays right next deputy chairman Rajya Sabha recently a new person have been appointed as a deputy chairman in the Rajya Sabha his name is Harivans Singh right his name is Harivan Singh who was elected so Harivan Narayan Singh who was elected as a chairman article 29 this is politics polity okay so this is the important term in this particular uh, topic Article 89 of the Constitution has the provision about the method of election of deputy chairman of Rajya Sabha. So this is Article 2089 of our Constitution, which allows election of a deputy chairman of Rajya Sabha. The deputy chairman is elected from among the Rajya Sabha members. The chairman of Rajya Sabha, that is Vice President of India, chairman of Rajya Sabha is Vice President of India, presides over the session of an election of deputy chairman. He or she presides over the proceedings of the Rajya Sabha in the absence of chairman of the Rajya Sabha. Basically, this vice, uh, vice chairman of Rajya Sabha will be presiding, presiding the Rajya Sabha in the absence of chairman of the Rajya Sabha. He or she will perform the functions of Rajya Sabha chairman in case of a vacancy or when the vice president is discharging the functions of the parliament. There is also a panel of six vice chairmen. Uh, there is also a panel of vice six vice chairmen, which is constituted every year. Okay, a vice chairman presides over the meeting of the Rajya Sabha in the absence of chairman or the deputy chairman right 
So that was the news of the week. Next, thermal battery plant. World's first ever thermal battery plant was recently inaugurated in Andhra Pradesh. In Andhra Pradesh, in this week, it aims basically to create new energy storage form with commercial applications. Basically, maintaining a low carbon footprint and less dependent on external factors like weather. Right? Conventional battery technology is based on the system of charging and discharging cycle. The conventional one is based on charging and discharging that are driven by electricity. Example, lithium ion battery, right? Which are used in electronic device. This thermal batteries use thermal energy to operate. This will be using thermal energy to operate. That is energy created by temperature difference. The energy that is created by temperature difference. The energy transfer in thermal batteries helps store heat. This will help store heat when heat travels from one part of the battery setup to the another. Now, how the working of thermal battery goes is it consists of two parts, such as cool zone known as sink and a hot source called source. When the sink of a thermal battery receives heat, okay, it transforms physically or chemically, thereby storing energy. While the source cooled down, during operation the sink is cooled down so it releases the stored energy while the source heats up and the application where it can be used is like in electric vehicles telecom infrastructures like telecom towers power incentive industries as well right so these are the few things uh, one should know uh, in relation to thermal battery plant next World Network of Biosphere Reserves. Here, in recent, in recent, the Kangcheng Jonga Biosphere, Kangchen, you can divide it in three, Kangchen Jonga Biosphere Reserve in Sikkim. Where? In Sikkim. Where is Sikkim? In the north of West Bengal and in the west of Bhutan has been included in the UNESCO designated this have been included in the USCO designated world network of biosphere reserves the decision was taken on 30th session of International Coordinating Council of man and biosphere program of UNESCO held at where important question palembang indonesia which was held this man and biosphere program of unesco was held in palembang indonesia it has become the 11th bioreserve with this kangcheng jonga of sikkim have become the 11th biosphere reserve for india to be included in wnbr that is World Network of Biosphere Reserve. The core zone of Kangjin Jongap National Park was designated a World Heritage Site in 2016 under the mixed category. It was actually earlier, this Kangjin Jonga National Park was designated as a World Heritage Site in 2016. Biosphere Reserve is one of the highest ecosystem in the world, reaching elevations of 100, 1220 meters above sea levels and these are considered as very important. So where is it came? Since Kangcheng Joga National Park is in where? Sikkim. So this is Sikkim, right? Capital of Sikkim means Gangtok, right? Chief Minister is Pawan. Mr. Pawan, here.
it is as i told it is in the north of west bengal you can see this is the north of west bengal and here this side is covered by bhutan you can see in the right side see sikkim on the right bhutan on the left nepal on the bottom west bengal and towards the north it is tibet okay so uh, sikkim is basically neighbored by three foreign countries bhutan tibet that is china and nepal and recently this donglang happened here in this case and this uh, is the way this is also called the chickens neck you can see here this is a very short passage through which the indians passes to the north east it is the passage to north east right similarly uh, the states you can see those are the important biospheres which have been recently considered for himachal pradesh the star one are the recently biosphere the star one like nanda devi of uttarakhand kanchenjunga of sikkim nokrek of meghalaya panchmari of uh, madhya pradesh ajnakumar amarkantak simlipal of odisha sundarban of west bengal agastyamala of karnataka tamil nadu and kerala nilgiri of tamil nadu kerala gulf of manar of tamil nadu andaman and nicobar islands great nicobar so those with a star mark have been recently added as a biosphere okay biosphere reserves earlier it were only a normal biosphere without a unesco heritage so you can say here himachal pradesh uh, the reserve is cold desert uttarakhand nanda devi sikkim kanchen jonga andhra pradesh arunachal pradesh dehang dibang Assam is Manas. Then Assam again we have Dibru, Saikhova, Meghalaya is Nokrak, uh, Madhya Pradesh Panna, Panna National Park, Madhya Pradesh Panchmari again, Madhya Pradesh Chhattis between the both the states it is uh, Anjana Kumar, Anj Kumar, Anj Kumar, Amar Kantak, Gujarat is Kutch, Odisha is Sibli Pal. West Bengal, Sundarban, Andhra Pradesh, Sesa Chalam, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Kerala. Together, they cover a reserve of Agastya Mala, Tamil Nadu, Nilgiri, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, both together, Nilgiri, Tamil Nadu, Gulf of Manar, Andaman, Nicobar, Great Nicobar. So, Biosphere Reserve is an international designation by UNESCO for representative parts of natural and cultural landscapes extending over large area of terrestrial or co uh, coastal marine ecosystems or a combination thereof. They are living examples of how human beings and nature can coexist while respecting each other's need. India is a signatory to the landscape approach supported by UNESCO's man and biosphere program biosphere reserve program is being implemented by government of india since 1986 it was implemented since 1986 the financial assistance under the program is given in 9 90 is to 10 ratio to the north eastern region states and three himalaya states and in the ratio of 60 40 to other states the state government prepares the management action plan which is approved and monitored by central mab committee that is management action plan which is approved and monitored by central mab committee okay Next news, ease of living index. The ease of living index will be launched along with an ease of living index dashboard, dashboard by Sri Hardeep S. Puri, that is Ministry of State, Housing and Urban Affairs. Apart 
from presenting the overall national ranking of triple one cities that is 111 cities the dashboard will present ranking of the cities across pillars category geographical zone and population classification ease of living framework comprises four pillars namely uh, it comprises four pillars namely institutional social economy and physical which are further broken down into 15 categories and 78 indicators the dashboard will also have comparisons the dashboard will have comparisons will have comparisons feature that will allow users to analyze the performance across cities on various livelihood parameters the ease of living index is an initiative of the ministry of housing and urban affairs to help cities assess their li livability vis-a-vis -vis global and national benchmarks and encourage city to move towards an outcome best so basically what to move towards an outcome best approach to urban planning and management next swatch munch way portal from the same have been uh, came across with swatch selection 2019 okay so this was importance over here is swatch selection 2019 IACR sounds alarmed with the discovery of deadly foreign mage pest in the Karnataka. Deadly foreign mage pest in Karnataka. The IACR, that is Indian Council for Agriculture Research, has sounded the alarm after the invasive agriculture pest fall army worm. Okay, so this is the worm pest which was discovered in Karnataka. In July so this major pest in North America the fall of army worm arrived in Africa this is this first arrived in Africa 2016 since then it has threatened the continent's maize crop the Karnataka finding in the first report of the pest in US Asia the discovery is more worrisome because this pest fits on this pest is fed on over hundred this is fed on over 100 crops such as vegetables, rice as well as sugarcane as well. To understand this, apart from this question have come like where Indian Agricultural Research Institution is situated. So in this case, what should be the answer? New Delhi, right? Similarly, Indian Veterinary Research Institute is uh, situated in Bareilly, Uttar Pradesh. National Dairy Research Institute is situated in Karnal, Haryana. Central Institute of Fisheries Education uh, located in Mumbai, Central Institute for Research on Buffaloes in Hisar, Central Institute of Cotton Research, Nagpur, Central Sip and Wool Research Institute, Avi, Avikanagar, Indian Institute of Horticulture Research, Bangalore, Indian Institute of Spice Research, Calicut, Indian Institute of Sugarcane Research, Lucknow. So those are the few renowned institutions in agriculture where questions have come in regular times. Okay, so which place they are located? Those have been asked. Like question will come. Central Institute of Fishery Education is located in which which of the places? Right. So answer will be for Mumbai. Right. So that is important in this. Next is Delhi High Court decriminalizes begging in the national capital earlier begging in national capital delhi was a criminal offense which recent which in recent delhi high court have decriminalized decriminalized the act of begging in the national capital was made a criminal offense after the bombay prevention of begging uh, act 1959 which was extended to delhi by a Central Government Amendment in 1960. The law prescribes a penalty of three years of detention in beggar homes in case of first conviction for begging and the person can be ordered to detain for 10 years in subsequent conviction. In India, 
20 states and two union territories have either enacted their own legislation or adopted the legislation enacted by other states. However, though begging have been lifted out as a decriminalization, as a decriminalization uh, act, but still, if someone makes someone begging, then that person will be taken into consideration and that will be a criminal offense. Next, cabinet approved construction of new four lane bridge on Kosi River at full, full out Bihar. Why this is important? The importance is of Kosi River. Okay, so we'll understand more on Kosi River. Let us first go through the basics of this topic. So, the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs by the Prime Minister Office approved the project for construction of 6.930 kilometer long four lane bridge at Philot in Bihar. There is a 10 kilometer long missing link between Philot and Bipura in NH 106 and falling in the catchment area of Kosi project. You can see here the Kosi which uh, suddenly comes from Nepal. This is Kosi, right? Comes from Nepal and it get divided. I, I can, uh, this is old Kosi river in the left. So if you come, you see the importance. This is all Kosi, right? So, and this is a very important source in Bihar as a basic water source, right? Even Kosi, the tributaries of Kosi get along with river Ganga. They also mix with river Ganga. So, the importance of this is the Kosi river has its source in Tibet that includes the world's highest upland. It then drains a large part of Nepal before emerging into the Gangetic plains because before it comes to Ganga, it, it drains a large part. It has uh, three major uh, tributaries, the Sun Kosi, Arun and Tabur. As you can see in the first, Sun Kosi, Arun and Tabur, right? See, this is Nepal. It runs. Uh, it drains a maximum area in Nepal too. At one point, just upstream of 10 kilometer George, cut through Himalaya foothills, the Kosi is 720 kilometer long. This is a 720 kilometer long, and drains an area of about 74,500 square kilometer in Tibet, Nepal, and Bihar. The Kosi River, also known as a sorrow of Bihar as the annual floods affect about 21,000 square kilometer of fertile agricultural lands. Here many a time questions have come that which what is the sorrow of Bihar? Which river is the sorrow of Bihar? For that answer will be river Kosi. Last but not the least of uh, the current affairs as India UK concerns of Khalistan movement. Khalistan movement was a movement by few uh, Sikhs, by few uh, Sikh who have been looking forward for creating a new country, Khalistan, which should be a major country for Sikhs. So Britain's Green Party supports had supported this controversial pro Khalistan rally due to. Uh, London, which happened in London, the rally is in support of a referendum for an independent Sikh homeland. This has heightened tensions between India and UK after Britain shared it wouldn't ban the demonstration despite concerns raised by India. Okay, despite concern, Britain have not given up and this have indeed brought little inconvenience in the relations as well of uh, in terms of this Khalistani movement right and India had uh, apart from this India have also earlier raised concern about this and Sikh Federation of UK 
has accused Indian authorities of overreacting to Sikh diaspora and describing the re-establishment of Sikh homeland as inevitable. And, you know, uh, this Khalistani movement uh, in the past have led to Operation Blue Star, Operation Blue Star, which have been, you know, uh, carried out in uh, June 1984, right? So, in June 1984, Operation Blue Star was the consequence of in this Khalistani movement. Okay, which was carried out around 1 and 8 of June 1984, which was ordered by then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi to remove militant religious leader Janel Singh Benderwale in his armed followers from the buildings or Harminder Sahib complex in Amritsar in the Golden Temple. Okay, because in July 1983, the Sikh political party Akali Dal's president Harcharan Singh Longowal had invited Vindravale to take care to take up residence in Golden Temple complex to evade arrest. Vindravale later on met the sacred temple complex and armory and headquarters. And in the violent events leading up to Operation Blue Star since the inception of Akali Dhan Yudh Morsha, the militants had killed 165 Hindus. This militants. Sikh militants had killed 165 Hindus and Nirankaris, even 39 Sikhs opposed to Hindravalas were killed. Even 39 Sikhs who have opposed Hindravale have been killed. The total number of deaths were 410, that is 410 in violent incident and riots, while 1180 people were injured. The operations Blue Star had two components basically Operation Metal, confined to Harmander Sahib complex, and Operation SOP, which raided the Punjabi countryside to capture other suspects. Okay, so uh, that was one of the, the militants were actually able to claim a safe haven in the most sacred place of the Sikhs due to the whole or part support received by them from the from the key Sikh religious leaders, right? And this uh, even brought uh, you know, a lot of problems in the community and uh, later on even Indra Gandhi somewhere died because of this reason, because hurting the sentiments of Sikhs, because it was not only militants, but also forcefully allowing a defense power to get into the Amritsar complex to get into the Golden Temple complex. So this have been a very, this have been a very important news in the past when it comes to Khalistani movement. And even there are many things which not everyone in India also know about this Operation Blue Star. Operation Blue Star was basically a military operation which was ordered by Indira Gandhi then, right? As I have already told. So, uh, it uh, ordered, Indira Gandhi had basically ordered to establish control over it, which was uh, earlier controlled by this Harminder Singh Bhindrawale. The Khalistan, uh, let us understand the Khalistani movement, like we are talking about the Khalistan movement. So, let us first understand this Khalistan movement. Khalistan movement originally started in the early 1940s the early 1940s and 50s but the movement was most popular in 1970 and 80 when Janel Singh Bhindrawale who was the leader of the Damdabi Taksal was another important factor which led towards Operation Blue Star. Bhindrawale had a heavy influence on the Sikh youth in Punjab during this time as the leader of the Taksal. Bhindrawale propagated original values of Sikhism and persuaded people, both young and old, 
to follow the rules and tenets of the religion. Binderwale is noted for his involvement in Operation Blue Star, in which he and Khalistan supporters occupied the Akal Takht complex, including the Golden Temple in Amritsar. Binderwale was widely perceived to be a supporter for the creation of a proposed Sikhism based theocratic state of Khalistan. The main motive of Operation Z Star was to eliminate Sant Janel Singh Bindrawale along with other Sikh militants and release, regain control over the Harminder Sahib in Amritsar. The operation, this Operation Blue Star, had two components to it. One, as I have already discussed, one was Operation Metal and one was Operation Sop. First, June, it all went from 1st June 1984. On 1st of June 1984, Guru Ram Das Langar building inside the Golden Temple was attacked by Indian Army. It That attack, around 8 to 10 people were killed. Approximate 7 divisions of army were deployed in Punjab. Media faced a blackout and transportation also suffered a major setback during that time. Outsiders were denied entry. In many parts of Amritsar, water and electricity supply was cut off. Punjab faced a complete curfew as the army and paramilitary were patrolling around. Harminder Sahib's entries and exits were completely sealed. Ramgharia Bungas inside the Harminder Sahib complex was bombed. Ordnance QF-25 pounder was used to attack the Sikh militants. Hotel Temple View and Brahm Budka Akhara on the southwest fringes of the complex were attacked by BSF and CRPF. Army used tanks to destroy the Akal Takht. Indian Army have gained control over Harminder Sahib complex finally on July, June 7, 1984. Media blackout. There was a media blackout. During the Operation Blue Star, the media in Punjab faced a blackout. Journalists were reportedly were put in military bus and amendment at border of Haryana. And then there was assassination of Indira Gandhi. Assassination of Indira Gandhi was the most notable event related to the Operation Blue Star. Indira Gandhi was assassinated, assassinated on October 31st. Four months just after the Operation Blue Star, and she was shot dead by two of her Sikh bodyguards, Satwan Singh and Mayan Singh. 33 rounds of bullets were fired on Indira Gandhi. The primary reason for assassination is the Operation Blue Star, which was ordered by her in earlier, and because of that, taking revenge, two Sikh bodyguards of hers have fired 33 rounds and Indira Gandhi have died. Apart from this, there was a bombing of any India flight 182. Okay, On June 23rd, in the same month, Air India flight 192, which was uh, operating on the Montreal-London-Delhi route, was blown up by a bomb at an altitude of 31,000 feet. The plan crashed into the Atlantic Ocean. A total of 329 people were killed, in which 268 were Canadians, 27 British citizens, and 24 Indians. The majority of the victims who died were Indo Canadians. The uh, incident was the largest mass murder in Canadian history. The attack is considered to be a retaliation against India for the Operation Blue Star, which carried out by the Indian Army to flush out several Sikh militants who had captured the Golden Temple. Inder Singh Rayat, a Canadian national, is the only person legally convicted to involvement in the bombing. Then, uh, also apart from this, Operation Blue Thunder is also uh, understood as an important fact over here because India saw a repeat of Operation Blue Star a few years later. A pressure Black Thunder was the name given to two operations that took place in India in the late 1980s to flush out remaining Sikh activities from the Golden Temple. Blanket commandos of the National Security Guards 
were used in this operation. Similar to uh, Operation Blue Star, these attacks were towards Khalistani militants who were using the Golden Temple in, as a base. The first Operation Black Thunder took place on April 30. The second Operation Black Thunder began on May 9th, 1988. First was in 1986-88. The operation was headed by Kamar Pal Singh Okay, the DGP of then. Operation Black Thunder was far more successful after Operation. Many of us, many of Indians don't know that after Operation Blue Star, a second operation was initiated, Operation Black Thunder, which was indeed more successful compared to Operation Blue Star. Right? So, this was. Uh, all about the current affairs, right? Now we'll move to the next part that is editorial. In editorial, the first topic is rebooting the system for a skills upgrade. The report of the Standing Committee on Labor, that is 2017 18, headed by Kirth Somania on the ITI, that is Industrial Training Institutions and Skill Development Initiative Schemes, present the grim condition of India's vocational education system. Here, basically, this system, the editorial, is somewhere talking about the skill upgradation, that is, the skill which is as of now and the skill which will be required. Now, before getting into this, we need to know a little history about this. ITS that is industrial training issues were basically initiated for the skill upgradation itself uh, that uh, that uh, workforce should be ready as for the industry. So this ITIs were initiated in 1950s in a span of 60 years approx 1896 public and 2000 private ITIs were set up. In 10 year period from 2007, more than 9000 additional private ITIs were accredited. The NSDC that is National Skill Development Corporation today has more than 6000 private training centers. Right. So apart from this even NSDC have more than 6000 private training centers. Now what are the concerns? Number of ITIs increasing rapidly, but they disregard, disregard norms and standards. Though they are increasing, but norms and standards somewhere are getting negative. Due to sort of courses, vocational training centers open and close. They open and close frequently. They are more prone to dilution of standards. With the increase of number of institutes, government has been unable to regulate private institutions for quality. Placements in NSDC training have been less than 15%. Private sector engagement in skill development has been taken up by the private training partners and not employers. The employers could have been made the system driven. So basically here the employer could have been made the system demand driven. But here the case is opposite. The lack of regulator for skill development has led to poor quality affiliation, assessment and certification. There are instances of responsibility outsourcing, no supervision, illegal activities and an ownership tussle between the central and state governments. QCI did not follow accreditation norms created by the National Council for Vocational Training. The NCVT is just a stamp with no role in actually assessing quality. Future of 13.8 lakh students in this substandard ITIs is at risk. If the same exercise were extended to other skill development schemes, the picture would be grimmer. Lax provisions of vocational training programs are no scrutiny is a major concern. For example, the standard training assessment and reward scheme spent 850 crores in 2013-14 with no norms of quality. 
The report also reinforces disturbing findings of a national survey by the Research Institute of the Planning Commission in 2011 about private ITS. Okay, had fewer classrooms, had fewer classrooms and workshops for practice, and the teachers were very poorly paid as well as they were not given proper opportunities for training. Now, what are the uh, possibilities to go forward? First is recommendation of the Sarda Prashad committee. The committee which have given the recommendation is Sarda Prasad. So the committee name is Sarda Prasad committee to rationalize the skills sec uh, sector skill councils. There is a need to establish a national board for all skill development programs. The core work assessment certification and core standards cannot be outsourced like every other education board. We would also have a mandatory rating system for ITIs. Ranking of the ITIs on several parameters, such as the one done by the National Assessment and Accreditation Council in Territory Education. Talent from open market should be encouraged to fill up higher posts in the skill development. There should be one system with one law and one nation vocational education training system. The ITIs have internal issues such as staffing and salaries that need attention. There is also critical need to reskill ITI teachers and maintain the student teacher ratio. Financial support from NSGC can be used to upgrade. Financing from corporate social responsibility, multilateral organizations such as the World Bank and the government can meet the financial needs for skill development. And as recommended by the 12th plan reimburse industry contribution, a 1 to 2 percent payroll tax that will be reimbursed when employers train using public private infrastructure and provide data. Right? So finally, we can conclude that with the rise of fourth industrial revolution, because now the, there is a revolution, right? There is an industrial revolution, and the industrial revolution of today is called the fourth generation industrial revolution. And on going debates on artificial int uh, intelligence and automation, there is an urgent need to reboot the vocational education system. Where today we are moving with AI, blockchain and big data, we cannot expect people from the vocational courses to have lack of information in this regard because this is a today's need. This is a need of fourth industrial revolution. And also there is a need to establish a system which is uh, based on demand and supply rather than present outdated and archaic syllabus of vocational education, right? So that is what is important in this. Now, since I'm talking about fourth revolution, so this is what is fourth revolution. I have tried to uh, give a glance in the picture. Like the first generation of industrialization was the mechanization, which was manual. Second was mass production of assembly line, right? That is electricity. The third is computer and information. And fourth is cyber physical system connecting every department with each other with a touch in hand. Everything in hand. The information in the hand. It, the impact are basically uh, to economy, business, national, society and individual. Altogether this impacts a lot because the economy is impacted. There is a whole down to, downpour, there is a change. Uh, this economy demands uh, more. So similarly, the supply is not adequate. You can see again the same thing here. One, 19, in 1784, the revolution one was based on mechanical production equipment driven by water and steam power. The second industrial revolution was in 1870 based on mass production of uh, the division of labor and use of electric energy. The third industrial revolution that was in 1969, which was based on use of electronics and IT to further automate. And the fourth that is yet to come for tomorrow that is based on cyber, cyber physical systems. 
right so this is 1 2 3 4 first was water and steam second was electricity third was automation and fourth is cyber and physical system when you see so when we compare the future employment in healthcare the, there will be increase there will be 45 percent increment in the healthcare 11 percent in education 15 percent in finance 14 percent in infrastructure 15 in energy as well right you can see here in mass customization where a one single concept car was for everyone now every individual is looking for a unique car for each it is local uh, globalization like where the thinking global have changed to act local internet of things that is iot have played a very vital role in connecting one part to other and 3d printing again you can see here where we were restricted to 2d printing now we have come with 3d printing as well which will be a big boom and this full size automated you can see this is a dashboard which have been printed in a single piece on an object 3D print, from a 3d printer okay which is also known as water transfer printing next years after the 8888 8, 8, 8 uprising why four times eight because august 8 2018 marks the 30th anniversary of the people uprising in myanmar this quadra 848 uprising is one of myanmar's most important historic days in the context of the pro-democracy movement because this quadra 8 was a people's movement that challenged the then the ruling burma socialist program party scream on political economical and social affairs which led the country into extreme poverty the protests on and the blood, a bloody crackdown gave there was a protest and bloody crackdown so earlier it was ruled by socialist program party which paved the way for current Myanmar State Council Aung San Suu Kyi entry into politics. She was actually put into bar. So uh, Myanmar's president Win Mint and Miss Suu Kyi were political prisoners in the aftermath of 1988 uprising. The objective of Quadra 8 was twofold to push for transfer of power from military to a civil leadership and a change in political system from an authoritarian regime to a multi-party democracy. And the significance were such the past in the past 30 years have seen change in leadership from military dictatorship to a military backed semi-democracy. Though it is not 100% democratic, there is a semi-military is backed semi-democracy in 2011 and then to a negotiated hybrid regime with power being shared between unelected military personnel and an elected civilian. It keeps alive the spirit of democracy, underscores the need of equality and federalism, but for countries' ethnic minorities, their struggle and political demands still continue and the kind of Federalism, the ethnic minorities want, based on equality of rights to all citizens, have been denied by the military leadership and uh, this uh, Myanmar exodus which happened, Rohingya exodus which happened in Myanmar also justifies somewhere similar. The democratic transition in Myanmar so far has been meticulously designed by the military. The primary objective which is laid out in the country's 2008 constitution is to give the military a dominant role in politics.
currently myanmar practices burmese way to democracy that is parallel to burmese way equality and federalism because 100 percent though it is democratic it is not 100 percent democratic it is only backed by the military and the success or failure of peace talks will largely depend on how these two issues are handled right so when it comes to myanmar uh, obviously on the left it is india to the north china to the west uh, laos to the south thailand right so the capital of myanmar is rangoon right what is the way forward the way forward is obviously to find a way from coming out of military power to civilian power and it will only happen and the more better democracy will bring a more better life for the country people right next liquid liquid water lake in mars what is the issue is scientists have recently discovered a liquid water lake in mars this is expected to facilitate a better understanding on the likely presence uh, life in mars like in the left you can see the surface then we have south polar layer deposits brighter sardas echoes so it is expected that Mars do have a liquid water lake. In the recent finding, an 11 member Italian team of researchers surveyed the Planium Austral region on the southern polar plains, on the southern polar plains of Mars. Who surveyed? Italian team. Okay, how many members? 11 members. So, uh, 11 member Italian team. They used the Mars advanced radar for subsurface and atmospheric soundings. Mars is this is a low frequency radar. So, what is Mars? Is? Mars is a low frequency radar on board the European Space Agency's Mars Express. The instrument beams radar pulses down to planet surface and measures how the waves reflect back to the spacecraft. This would give information on the kind of materials even below the surface. The team have discovered a lake stretching for 20 kilometers. They have discovered a lake stretching for 20 kilometers and have found 1.5 kilometer under the southern polar ice caps right so despite temperature of about six minus 68 degrees centigrade the water remains in liquid form radar profile of the lake closely matches this radar profile of the lake closely matches those of subglacial lakes on earth beneath the ice sheets of greenland and antarctica it meets with the ice sheets of Greenland and Antarctica. So, how in liquid form atmospheric pressure on the Martian surface is almost a hundred times less than on Earth. This atmospheric pressure is how many times? Hundred times less. Again, a question. So, this ensures that water would not be in liquid form. It would not be in liquid form, but rather as ice or vapor. So the presence of water is much beneath the surface. The liquid form could be due to heavy presence of this. What they are expecting is the liquid can be because of sodium, magnesium and calcium because the atmospheric pressure is way too less. So it is quite tough that there should be liquid. But if even if it is there, it should be a very much underground of the ice sheets. And this may reduce the temperature and help in retain liquid forms. Along with immense pressure of ice from above lowers the bridging point as well. What is the significance? The majority of modern mass is dry and barren, but plenty of evidence has been found that the red planet Mars is also called as the red planet. Question may come that which of the planet is called as a red planet, and that the answer will be 
mass which is used to be a much better place however any liquid water was believed to be transitional in salt lake pools are uh, flowing down hill sides in the martian summer so the discovery of a large stable stagnant lake on mars is significant it offers new potential targets for future missions and places to search for signs of past or present microbial life however the sheer saltiness of the spot raises doubt to this belief right so that was all about the mars achievements next is deciding on article 35a why in news the current uh, the supreme court has recently adjourned the hearing on petitions relating to article 35 what is article 35a article 35a basically empowers jammu and kashmir constitution to define per permanent residences of the state only the jammu and kashmir assembly can change the definition of pr through a law ratified by a two third majority it provides some special rights and guarantees to safeguard the unique identity of people of jammu and kashmir it was bought in by a presidential order it was basically bought by presidential order in 1954 the supreme court uh, the fact is the supreme court is hearing the petition challenging the validity that is uh, hearing regarding the validity of article 35a the legitimacy of the instrument of accession by which jnk united with india is in question because the validity of negotiation with lead to the adoption of article 370 is also questioned when article 35a is questioned with article 370 basically underscores jnk special legal status and has actually given the center the power over the state the case has been adjourned as jnk administration and center cited local poll preparation the center has also said an interlocutor has been appointed and the talks are going on what is the contention from a purity individual rights on economic integration perspective the case for 35a is not clear cut there is a contention that any restriction differ, differentiating residents or non residents are inherently discriminatory but this argument would not only invalidate 35a with respect to kashmir alone several other states including mizoram nagaland himachal would also be affected by it constitution as per constitution article 370 is the only mechanism that allows the indian union to legally exercise power in kashmir abrogating the mechanism is not just abrogating a special a specific policy it would amount to repudiation of an important part of the legal structure which india stand blessed upon what had the court stands been as a matter of law the status of article 35a had been considered by the supreme court in the past the court had observed that the indian state needs to honor the terms and conditions in different instruments of accession accordingly the sc has noted that essentially the laws governing jnk are part of a political settlement so it is up to the political process to process modify the terms of settlement and not the not that of the judiciary so how to do with it the challenge is living in the political process is that application of this principle could be deeply politicized so the supreme court can instead uphold the validity of 35a through its judgment nevertheless it should also ensure to not completely leave it to mercy of jnk assembly when it comes to discrimination issues right so that was all about article 35a which was related to jammu and kashmir which is in the court for the discussion of somewhere not compiling as per the policy and somewhere not uh, transparent as well which was uh, actually signed by that prime minister 
Jawaharlal Nehru in 1954. Next topic is stress in the cane industry. What is the issue? Basically, in this the sugar industry is currently facing a serious financial crisis. Improper government policies are what have caused this malish. And because of this, there is an overall crisis when it comes to glut. Sugar output, glut means sugar output is estimated to have surged by nearly 10 million tons in 2017-18 to 32.2 million tons. While this is already way above the demand of around 25 million tons, the estimated output for 2018-19 is slated to be even higher at 35 million tons. Notably, this spike is largely because of government's recent pro can growers stance with an eye on the forthcoming general election in 2019. Excess supplies have dragged X factory sugar prices below production cost leading to can price areas of about Rs 180 billion and the bulk of this are accounted for by sugar mills in Uttar Pradesh due to the relatively higher cost of states mandated procurement price as the glut in the market is likely to depress prices Further, banks have moved the sugar sector to the caution list. This would make it harder for them to borrow and resultantly only make the possibility of recovery grimmer. How did this come? The genesis of sugar sector woes is rooted in the overproduction. Basically, this has come because of the overproduction of both sugar cane and sugar, and the consequential meltdown. Of sugar prices obviously when the production will be more there will be consequential meltdown but instead of this uh, incentivization additional cane production the government is taking measures which would enhance more cane cultivation in the recent sharp hike of rupees 20 a quintal in the fair and remunerative price for cane is an example mandatory additional payments for sucrose recovery in excess to 10 percent and cash toll of rupees 5 as per quintal of can used by the mills also for the production also permitting direct conversion of cane juice into ethanol instead of using only by the pipe products for this purpose might encourage more cane production fiscal incentives for setting up more distilleries and creation of 3 million tons sugar of buffer are some other misguided policies right so this aside, the government has also doled out an elaborated uh, package of soaps to the sugar factories to contribute their operations. What is the way ahead is the solution lies in letting the production of both sugarcane and sugar move in tandem with overall market demand, including exports. The way because we export a lot more, the way to achieve this objective is outlined explicitly in the report submitted by the Ranga Rajan committee. So the committee which was formed for the sugar regulation is Ranga Rajan committee. So this is the most important part of this particular topic. The revenue selling formula for can price included by it can help strike the needed balance between the supplies and demand and also establish a buffer. This mechanism also seems fair to both cane growers and sugar producers as it envisages selling 70 to 75 percent of the revenue earned by the mills with farmers. Nonetheless, the transparency in the assessment of the sugar factory revenues is vital to make this system a success, which could prove challenging, right? So these are the important topics and uh, with this we will uh, put up for today's class and we'll meet again in the next session with some innovative moreover and the next uh, topic will be discussing
with some more important topics and then we'll go for the banking awareness which are uh, which have been waited since a long time right so thank you very much for hearing my life i'll see you